<laughs> Might as well. All right. Good morning, Oak Hill Congregation. It's great to see each and every one of you. I'm looking for that book that we keep up here for display. I have mine at the house, of course, for the five minutes a day, Devo with God. Very thankful that we have availability for devotionals every day to read the assigned text in the Bible. Read someone's well-studied paragraph devotional and then go back to the text and see what you may have missed the first time and to... Uh, have it stick in your mind more as you live each day. This right here is our standard in all religious matters. It is from God for us. And who are we to look to God and say, I think I'll do it this way. Thank you. Uh, God resists the proud. As time goes on, I think we've learned that we do as well. And it may never, never be defined in our own spirit as that. Very eager, very eager for the message of this lesson today. I appreciate uh, that petition included in Austin's prayer because we have a lot of great things to discuss. I love the summer series that we are having in our annual theme, and that is growing in faith and fellowship and family. I am also so thankful for the great quality lessons that we are having in this series, uploaded for those who can't make it here. But like I've illustrated, and, and apparently it was very effective, uh, some feedback that I heard, it's like going to the gas station and letting the high-octane fuel just be poured onto the ground. You're paying for it, but it's not doing you a bit of good. In this case, allowing yourself to be in the environment where spiritual prepared specialties and lessons are shared to help your Christian walk. Uh, I know it's not easy through the week, but if you can, it all means be here for those special lesson series. Bill Bajants is coming up this uh, Wednesday, and every lesson and every title and speaker is on, uh, on the uh, display board in the foyer for you to see and plan for. Uh, very eager for that. And growing. If we grow in faith, it affects every other area of our lives, and we, in turn, fulfill our mission, which is equipping disciples to make new disciples. Would you say it again with me? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. This is the Lord's commission to us. We love him. We want others to know the joy that comes from following him. Let's get into the lesson. It's going to be abbreviated in some respects. I, I, I just want to get to the point today. and I appreciate getting back into this series after the holiday um, delay. Today we're going to talk about a special beatitude, one of my favorites in this series. We are not yet going to show how each beatitude builds in succession and is categorized in two main ways. That's coming up next time. But for us today, right now, I want to encourage you in all of this to just uh, eat healthier. <laughs> Good nutrition is vital to a prolonged life. And I want you to enjoy a good balanced diet. Good nutrition is essential to live. But as will be demonstrated and as is illustrated as well in everyday living, people are not eating or consuming what they need to live. Both the quality of life now and prolonged for all of eternity. They're not eating what they truly need to live. And we're talking in our series in class about the divine fruit. How that's really the cream of life. Today, the question is before us, what do you really want? What do you truly want? In so many of my lessons and classes, we've addressed these pr principles and topics, so it may seem familiar to you in one presentation today. But there is a secret to being happy. When I say happy in this context, it's this condition of spiritual joy from being in right standing with God. We are going to talk today about where you and I need to go for true satisfaction. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean? It means Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't have Jesus. You don't have any one of them. You're lost, and you are not truly living. And so many people don't have Christ. They're just running around like a hamster on a circular wheel, frustrated, exhausted, and they don't know which direction to go, what they're here for. I mentioned in class, I do not know how I could live without knowing my purpose, the identity of the one who put me here. I could not imagine that. So I want to know more and more that craving for Christ. Hmm. There's our secret for today. And we're going to look, look at this. I never travel anywhere. If we're supposed to go through life on the way of Christ, I never travel without my GPS. Uh, I certainly prefer to follow an address punched into that device instead of following people's local directions. Uh, I just don't like doing that. Uh, I usually say, uh, do you, okay, uh, thank you for the visuals. Uh, do you have an address? And that helps me all the more. Well, our best efforts in life got us lost. So I don't want to follow my own way, nor do I want to follow what someone else says. I want to follow the map 
the roadmap to heaven from the one who created this world. That's what I want. And I look at the Bible for that. God's word shows us the straight path to heaven through the cross. And the best question you can ask is, what does the Bible say I need to do to go to heaven? And then the best decision that you can make from that point forward is to let the Bible tell you those answers and then to yield, of course, to the, its precepts and commands. A lot of people today have this idea that if I can find the right circumstance or line up the right happenings, then I can find happiness. It even rhymes and is connected in our English use of words there. We think, I'll be happy when. I call it when and then thinking. Some of you, after the first presentation, got the idea very quickly. It's, it's a when and then thinking. The world has this mindset of when I get in school, then I'll be happy. When I get out of school, then I'll be happy. When I get a job, then I'll be happy. When I become rich or married, then I'll be happy. When I have children, then I'll be happy. When the children leave home, then I'll be happy. I always love that humor there. You've heard it said it before. When and then thinking. It's a little consolation to know that men, men have always thought that, though. Way back in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, which is what we began our series with, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon is beginning... Well, he's documenting his lifelong journey to find what makes a person happy and joyous and fulfilled. What's the meaning of it all? Take away God. And, and what's the meaning of it all? If you want to save time and frustration, read Ecclesiastes and especially that conclusion. Uh, Solomon was the richest, most powerful man in the world. He had it all. And if he didn't have it, he could get it. He traveled every direction that so many people go down to find happiness, but he says it didn't work. And people still think today that they are the exception, but they're not. What roads did he travel down? Well, he traveled down the road of possessions. Oh, if I just get this, then I'll be happy. He had it all. Some inventions were you know, maybe later created, but in the best of his day, he had everything at his fingertips. There are more products today and, and opportunities, and they all claim satisfaction guaranteed. They'll take your money, they'll take your time, but he had it all, and none of them would feel your soul's lasting desire for this joy and need for that. Someone says, even when I get what I want, it's not what I want. And that is so, so true. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This, too, is meaningless meaningless if you if, if think of how much money we would save if we just accepted that truth that that next product won't give you the happiness that you think is missing in your life now we can enjoy certain things there's nothing wrong with that but possessions i need that or i would enjoy having that what's our true need Tr solomon traveled down the path of performance performance, he says in verse 4, I made my works great, or I made great works. He undertook great projects. And in verse 9, he says, so I became great and excelled more who lived in Jerusalem before me. He was the grandest. He was the greatest. He made his mark in history. And so many times we want to do that as well. We want to feel significant and important and, and validated, uh, return to the society that we've, uh, you know, been blessed from. But Ecclesiastes 2.21, for a man may do his work with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. Death is the great equalizer. That'll make you think about things, won't it? It doesn't matter what you do or accomplish. This physical body is not designed to live forever here. And isn't that true? You build, you work, you accumulate, and then it won't do you any eternal good. That's a truth shocker. That's a perspective checker. It's a popular myth that success will bring happiness. And while we esteem giving God your best and the reward of excellence that comes, the joy of satisfaction from giving God your all, remember Ecclesiastes is how to find joy without the God factor in your life. After the thrill of winning anything comes the emptiness of knowing that something more important is still not there. Successful performance temporarily inebriates, but it in itself does not satisfy. So why waste your time on what doesn't satisfy? Solomon traveled down this pleasure, uh, this path of pleasure. He says in chapter three, well, in verse uh, ten of this, the Good News version says. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart any pleasure. Wow. 
If it feels good, do it. If you see it, you want it, get it. I mean, he, just do, get whatever you want. And he had the means to do that. But pleasure, and he tells, says this, is all vain. It, it's the most temporary form and shallow form of happiness. If it were not so, then wouldn't you think that every American home would be filled with contentment and joy right now? Because their homes, their yards, their closets, their, their garages, their, uh, their, their rented garage storage rooms are filled with junk that they first purchased, thinking that it would give them that lasting happiness. Well, it didn't last, did it? Did it ever meet the real need? No, not even that. Ecclesiastes 2 Ecclesiastes 2 verse 1 talks about, I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But this also proved to be meaningless. Solomon was the richest man. He traveled down all these roads and he said that they're just dead end roads. Dead end roads. That doesn't sound very appealing to me. I don't like the idea of dead. You work all this time, you achieve things in vain. I don't want my life to be in vain. So, I need to realize the secrets of satisfaction that bring a constant, genuine uh, happiness that's felt within you no matter the circumstance. Now we're talking about that divine joy. And Jesus starts his Sermon on the Mount with this, these principles. And what is the secret? Where is the source? How can I have life? And by the way, I think that the word life is the greatest word of life. Because if you're not existing, if you're not living, then even love doesn't make any difference to you. You're not experiencing that. Life is the key word. And Jesus used it so often in his ministry in the Gospels. And he says, I can have this, uh, I, uh, let's see, L-I-F-E, this lasting importance for eternity. I can have life with the Spirit of God infusing my very soul or spirit as well to live life to the full, John 10, 10. I can have it. How? And he says very clearly, if, if, and that's the greatest condition, hinged on the greatest word of life. You can have life if you follow the word of God. And here in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, we're going to see what our Lord says about true happiness and how that it's rooted in a craving for what he can provide because it's the essence of who he actually is. Today it's hard to relate to physical analogies of this type of word for craving or hunger because we, we might get hungry and we can go to the fridge and it's stocked full of food perhaps. And, and, and most Americans, I think as a whole, are not really hungry to that point, to the essence that we need to relate to what uh, intensity of the word Jesus is using here. Hungry, starving, I need this to live. Most Americans are not physically hungry, but a very popular public figure a few years ago said, America is starving emotionally. Well, it's manifested emotionally. Uh, it's certainly visualized in so many ways and expressed that way where we can see and hear it. But America is not starving emotionally. This emotional expression of what we're starving from is more of a spiritually based hunger. A spiritually based hunger. And these are some phrases that we can sadly all too relate to, um, some more than others. The sad fact is that sometimes people don't even know what they're hungry for, but they say things that show you that they are. Things like this. My life is empty. You ever feel that way? My life is empty. I'm restless. My favorite one to hate. I'm bored. I've never, I've always wondered what to do next or what can I do now, but I've never wondered this, but that's just me. But others may say things like, something just seems to be missing. There's got to be more to life than this, and there is. Why are people so hungry and yet still so unsatisfied and unfulfilled? It's because they're rejecting the one source that can provide it. They're looking in the wrong places. Let's look for what Jesus says straight from him. He says there are some things you need to know for true satisfaction. Step number one, recognize your real hunger. We are spiritual beings wrapped in flesh. We are spiritual beings. This is our vessel while we're on this planet Earth. A lot of verses are printed for you to read on your outline. Psalm 37, 4, Deuteronomy 8, 3. There are so many people that don't know what they're hungry for in life. But we are made in God's image, spiritually speaking. That means that God created us to have a yearning, a craving for Him. And that means only He can feel it. He created us to need Him and we love that relationship He wants with us. And then 
woe be to the person who rejects that relationship through his word because then they can't have the happiness he wants to provide. Psalm 37, 4. Very fascinating passage in the Old Testament. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. <laughs> okay, so if I love the Lord, he'll give me anything I want. Wait, let's back up. Your delight is in the Lord. He will give you of himself that sustains and meets your needs. He created you to be fulfilled by your seeking his will. This is the proverb. Uh, this is the proverbial truth. This is the truth that we're reading here in the Beatitudes. Let's notice it again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Delight yourself in the Lord. And they shall be filled. He will give you the desires of your heart. Who would have thought that Beatitude is in the Old Testament? Right there. Concept by concept. Happiness is not what you're needing or wanting. Happiness is a byproduct of what you truly need. And that is a hunger for God that's growing closer to him every day by doing what, what he has prescribed in his word. All of these cravings, all of these feelings, these desires and hungers in life are really there to show us that. Now I want to read Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Moses was leading the children, the whiny children of Israel, uh, out through the wilderness. And, oh, wow. Wow. God, he says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which neither you or your fathers had known, to teach you, to teach me what God allowed this hunger, to teach me what? That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In my own reworded application, I would say this, we don't depend on the blessings. We depend on the God who gives us the blessings we need. You get that idea? We're looking to God here. And that's the idea. Not just physically, spiritually. God lets you or allows hunger in your life or even some problems to come into your life to get your attention and remind you what you really need is, is Him. So Jesus would say, you need righteousness? Who's righteous? Who's the de very definition and embodiment of righteousness? It's Jesus. Jesus is saying, you really not just want me, you need me. So as we continue, pain drives us to food. Pain drives us to food. And God is encouraging you to come feast upon the real thing. Step two, once I realize what I really need, I need to look at what my current diet is and not buy that stuff anymore. Stop eating spiritual junk food. Isaiah 55 verse 2 says, Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? <laughs> I don't want to waste my time, my life, my energies. My, I, I don't want to waste anything. I want to live life. And I, and I know you do too. And if you don't think that there's objective truth, then you wouldn't think that's that even possible. But I want to live life. Our world has never offered more spiritual junk food than it does today. And I came across a phrase that, that captured this well. He says, moving from pleasure to pleasure, thrill to thrill, horoscopes to crystals, and yet nothing seems to be the answer. From fad to food to thrill, nothing seems to work. It's junk food. And I'm amazed that with our study of the prophets uh, in our upcoming uh, growth group series, uh, that the Old Testament has a lot to say against the things that sometimes Christians in ignorance participate in. They're not reading the prophets and the same principles apply to today. It's junk food. Stop eating that. And as a side note, appetites are dramatically influenced by your associations. We want to be a spiritual friend to you. And that means when you're around us, the Bible is everywhere. Association with people who have an appetite for the things of God means that over time it will begin to whet your appetite for the things of God. We want to help you that way. That's why we're here. Step three, look to Jesus for real satisfaction. Look to Jesus for real satisfaction. Hunger for righteousness. We could talk about what is righteousness. And we think about how certain people do so many good deeds. And we think that's righteousness. Look at all the good deeds that he or she did. Uh, but we can also know that you can do good things and still not be in right standing with God. And that's the key. Righteousness in, in terms of us is right standing with God. And it manifests itself in all that we do. But let's jump to the key question. Who is righteous? Who is the source and embodiment of righteousness? All the good deeds apart from Christ won't save me. Christ frees and forgives me so that I can live the righteous life. And that means there's only one thing that can make me righteous. Romans 3, 22. 
This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's biblical faith, of course, a faith that yields itself to everything that he says to do as we give him our best to try to do it. But satisfaction in righteousness, Jesus says, is only in me. You really are saying, I need, I, 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 uh, let's see, you need me. Jesus is saying, I am the source of that righteousness. Blessed are they who hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He uses some metaphors in John chapter 6, 35, and then verse 51. John 6, verse 35 I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. I am the living bread. Remember what we read earlier in, in the Moses account in Deuteronomy? God gave us what we needed and in so many more ways. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. I want to live forever. The bread of life. He says, I'm what you need for sustenance. And a lot of this self-help propaganda out there is just a derivation of the, of the New Age philosophy that people love to embrace because it meets their need for pride and ego. And it's really just a way of saying find satisfaction from within. If you're hungry, if your stomach is phys physically hungry, do you tell your stomach, feed yourself or go find your own food? No. You would remain just as unhappy and satisfied if you told your stomach to feed yourself as you would telling yourself, be your own God. And that's what people are saying. You're good enough as you are. You don't need anything. And they're staying miserable for that reason. Here's a second metaphor in John chapter 4, verse 13. Whoever drinks this physical water will again thirst. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, I'll become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Do you believe that? Whether we experience that right now or not, do you believe that? As Christians, we were talking about joy in our class, divine joy. We know we want it, and yet we sometimes don't feel it. What's wrong with us? Maybe we're just not doing and thinking what we ought to be doing and thinking. We need to look to Jesus and have a craving for him. Well, what if I, I need to develop the craving? Well, just one bite at a time. Next thing you know, your body physically begins to change and adjust to the new diet that you have. Same thing spiritually as well. Jesus is the bread. He's the water and and we need both to live so what's Jesus really saying here in John 10 Jesus is described as the door and this is an animation that once filled the screen in a different lesson Jesus is the door to many things he's the door to our sustenance he's the bread he's the water what he's saying is you don't just want me you need me not just momentarily or physically, but he's also saying you need for a complete well-balanced diet. You need to understand that what we're really giving you is life. I am saved. Jesus is my salvation. He's the door, the threshold. Nothing else will replace that. There is nothing else that will save me. Nothing else. You might be saying to yourself, there's got to be more to life than this. And there is. Notice the promise as we close, Matthew 5, verse 6, for they will be filled. That is a promise. They will be filled. Only God can say satisfaction guaranteed. And we're not just talking your money back. We're talking satisfaction guaranteed. Life eternally. Only God can provide what we are created to need from him. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Sin gets in the way. We go our own way. Why do we do that? Truth stings the impenitent, but it blesses those who are humble. Uh, in conclusion, are you hungry for the things of God? I think that there are three stages of life and a person goes through. They first inter are introduced. They see things that they don't understand yet or have. And they say, oh, you know, I want God in my life. Yeah, I want God in my life. And then they grow a little bit more. Say, you know, I, I, I need God in my life. I really do. I'm depending on him more and more every day. And then they reach a stage that I hope that you get to or are at right now. I've, I, can't, I can't live without God. I, I've got to have him in my life because I've needed him all along. Only God can say, satisfaction guaranteed. Let him fill you. Let him complete you. Let him meet the desires of your heart. It amazes me how so many Christians take a, have a take it or leave it approach to rethink, uh, religious matters. I've always obviously cared more about the church in, than, than some of my peers around me in school. The direction I went in life shows that maybe because of, sad to say, the situations that they find themselves in. They didn't make the right choices. They didn't care about the things of God and have verbally expressed that to me sometimes. If you're not close to God and have the satisfaction 
in your life that you want. Don't blame anybody else. Now, we're to help each other through our struggles, but that's not what we're talking about. If you don't choose to know God, you're making the choice to remain unfulfilled. Here's a quote for you. Many Christians have enough faith to bug them, but not enough faith to bless them. Oh, that's good. How's your hunger today? How's your thirst for God? How is your hunger and thirst for God? Well, I was just noticing here this book that we were looking through. Let me get this one again. I like this book as I hold it up every Sunday morning. I encourage you, but at this point I'm going to uh, personalize it just a little bit. How are you doing in your daily devotionals? Do you look forward every morning to starting your day with a devotional from God? Are you craving the things of God? Sunday night we're having a service, specially crafted. More lesson and effort went into this lesson tonight than even this morning. Are you craving to learn from that lesson tonight? If you feed on God, you can know a life that satisfies on a prolonged basis. Real happiness, divine joy comes from satisfaction that comes when Jesus is the foundation for your life. Maybe you're hungry for God. Maybe, uh, maybe that spiritual hunger is, is, is growing. That's great. Great. Feed it. Continue it. I'm hungering for righteousness. I need to be in Christ. And sometimes there's that song that says, Lord, I'm, I'm seeking after you again. It's one of the newer songs. Uh, Restore the joy in my heart. Light the fire within righteousness. Or maybe you've been sick and that hunger is returning. That's a good sign. But maybe you realize that the life that you're, uh, I've described today is not what describes you. It's because it, it's very, it, it could be because you're not in Christ. How do you put on Christ? He's the only source of what you really need. So why not just go ahead and say, I'll sacrifice myself on that cross, my own cross, and follow Christ whose blood shed on his cross for me, took care of my sins so that I can rise to walk in newness of life. Michael, you've talked about it. I haven't experienced it yet, but I know I want it because it's the only right choice to make. Let's put him on in baptism as we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain free, it's for you and